Our final presentation for today includes three Health and Human Services Commission partners who will share information on local mental health and behavioral health authorities, resources to support families, prevention and behavioral health promotion, and substance use treatment for youth. Please remember that you will have access to all the presentations and information on the School Mental Health TX.org website and in the UT box. So please take the time to actively listen without feeling the need to take copious notes. Welcome, Gabrielle, Letitia, and Victoria. Thank you. And I'm going to start out. My name is Gabrielle Rogers, and I'm going to kind of go over the services with HHSC. Um, on the children's mental health side, and then I'll pass it on to the other two presenters who will cover substance use prevention and programs within HHSC. Um, and like has already been shared, well, there's going to be a lot of information shared shortly with you guys in a very short amount of time. So don't feel like you need to take a bunch of notes because this is all going to be provided to you in the resources as well. Next slide. So this first part, we're gonna go over children's mental health and we'll learn about local mental health authorities and the local behavioral health authorities, discuss some of our initiatives that are used to support families. And then there'll be an opportunity to share resources. So currently in Texas, the local mental health authorities and local behavioral health authorities, and I'll, for the rest of the slide, do LMHAs and LBHAs, provide crisis services and access to specialized mental health care, including evidence-based practices, promising practices, and other supportive children services for children with serious emotional disturbances. And in the state of Texas, we have 37 local mental health authorities and two local behavioral health authorities. And both of them use the Texas Resiliency and Recovery Model as their treatment model to provide service delivery services deliveries for community-based mental health services. And so they establish eligibility for receiving these services, determine a recommended level of care, and provide guidance about the level of care authorization. The TRR model, or the Texas Resiliency and Recovery Model, values child-centered, family-focused engagement, evidence-based practices, and fidelity. The TRR level of cares or LOCs are the building blocks of a systems of care built on the foundational elements of resiliency and recovery. They include services that reflect the strengths of the child and family. And the intensity of the services is determined by the uniform assessment, which includes the child and adolescent needs and strength assessment. And so this is a brief overview of the different levels of care and how they are transitioned between the higher levels to the lower levels, and then also some additional levels of care that off to the side. Um, you can see we have young child, early onset, residential treatment center, transitional age, youth, and youth empowerment services. And I'll go over each of these in a little bit um, so you have more information on them. Next slide. So the first one is LOC zero or crisis services, and these are available 24-7. So if appropriate, crisis services can provide brief interventions to children experiencing a mental health crisis. Services are intended to resolve the crisis and avoid, avoid a more intensive and restrictive intervention and to help prevent additional crisis events. So accessing crisis services for children, if you have a youth who's experiencing a mental health crisis, you can contact your LMHA or LBHA crisis hotline. Um, or the current treatment team to request a crisis screening. And the crisis hotline can deploy what they call a mobile crisis outreach team or MCOT team to conduct a crisis assessment. And this could include reviewing clinical documentation that's already been completed. After the crisis assessment is complete, MCOT provides a recommendation or referral to resources. If appropriate, MCOT or current treatment team will work with the guardian to connect the child to the LMHA or LBH services for future referrals. One of these um, referrals could be to the inpatient care wait list. And so this is used when the local mental health authority or LBHA determines the child requires inpatient services, but there's no inpatient treatment available in the local service area. 
and it's intended to secure admission into a psychiatric hospital. So the role of HHSC staff during this process is to monitor that wait list and connect the LMHAs and LBHAs with their liaison to receive updates on when um, on each child and provide support and technical assistance. LOC4 is intensive family services. So this is intended to serve children with severe risk behaviors, threatened community tenure and risk of juvenile justice involvement. Core services include intensive case management, certified family partner, counseling and skills training and development. And it's used to develop a wraparound or ICM plan using wraparound services. LOC Youth Empowerment Services or YES Waiver. It serves children three through 18, provides an array of services to keep children out of institutions and prevent parental relinquishment. The goals of this program is to reduce the amount of time the child's out of the home and the community because of a mental health need, expand available mental health services and supports, and improve the lives of children and youth. LOC Early Onset or Coordinated Specialty Care. So this is an evidence-based practice and specialized treatment approach for individuals ages 15 to 30 who are experiencing their first episode psychosis. And this is currently available at 24 of our LMHAs and LBHAs um, to specifically work with this population. Residential Treatment Center Project. So this provides intensive support for families with a child at risk of being placed into DFPS custody because a family has exhausted their local community options and for a youth who requires mental health treatment in a residential treatment center. As of June 2021, families had more options to access this, and some of that includes contacting their LMHA or LBHA or contacting um, DFPS directly to request re referral to this project. The family would be <clears throat> assigned the LOC RTC, um, and this ensures support to families before getting into a residential treatment center during the residential treatment center and after that process. And services include family case management and certified family partner support. Another one of our um, LOCs is transition age youth. So these are for young adults discharging from ch children's mental health services into adult mental health services. And so they have access to this transitional service and allows young adults to continue accessing intensive case management past the age of 17, and they can obtain skills necessary for transitioning to adulthood. Another one is our family support services. So this is provided by a certified family partner, and it's a, who is a parent or guardian who has lived experience raising a child with mental, emotional, or behavioral health challenges, and has at least one year of successfully navigating a child serving system. The LMHA or LBHA assist in connecting the families with a certified family partner, but this can be a valuable tool for really anybody who has a youth experiencing um, mental or, or any emotional need and struggling navigating the system because there's a lot. A certified family partner assists parents or caretakers by introducing and engaging them with mental health treatment processes, providing guidance and modeling advocacy when navigating various child serving systems, assisting in identifying the family's natural supports and strengths and providing practical guidance in nurturing relationships. One of our new initiatives that started um, this fiscal year and should be fully open by middle of next year is Children's Crisis Respite. So there's some selected programs that'll address the mental health needs of children through crisis respite services. And so it's for youth who are experiencing a crisis who don't necessarily meet inpatient psych hospitalization, where they can still stay within their community and not have a disruption of their life or services, but it provides the family with some intensive crisis respite. Another one is our Children's Mental Health System Navigator. So this position will develop enhanced partnerships with the local child serving systems and resources to promote greater understanding and collaboration to support the provision of these services and treatment for children. And this one's also recently started and should be up within this next year to help support um, families who are navigating all of these different serving systems. COVID-19 supplemental funds. So there's a bunch of things that we've been able to have help with due to COVID-19. 
One is outpatient capacity expansion. And so this expands outpatient mental health services to address the growing need in our population and address funding disparities and local challenges. There's also a housing support line, which is available 24 seven, and it provides mental health and substance use support to people at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness. We also have coordinated specialty care expansion, and this is gonna expand our coordinated specialty care by adding additional seven teams to LMHAs and LBHAs, and additional 17 sites will receive funding this next year. Thank you, and I'll pass it on to leave Victoria's next. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and bearing with us. I know we're the last panel, so you folks are um, probably just ready to close out for the day. Been a lot of information, but thanks so much for staying with us. Uh, thank you again to the TEA for allowing us to present to you today. Uh, my name is Victoria Moreno, and I'm a program specialist here at the Prevention and Behavioral Health Promotion Unit. And um, I know that that's a mouthful. So we will move forward into talking about what the unit uh, really is. So Prevention of Behavioral Health Promotion Unit or PBHP, um, as a unit, we not only seek to uh, prevent and reduce the use of the state's four prevention priorities, being alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and other substances such as prescription drugs, um, but also to really promote behavioral health and uh, really nourish communities from, from the top down, which we'll talk more about in the coming slides. But um, really our efforts are funded by the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant by SAMHSA or the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And um, this block grant is, is a huge block grant as it's stated in the name. It goes well outside of just the prevention programs I'm talking to you about today. And 20% uh, of the block grant funds in particular are used for prevention. So I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the, the history of prevention. Prevention as we know it is relatively new and historically the state of Texas has really focused on targeting uh, risk factors that occur at the individual level and the relationship level. So some of the strategies that you might see here are in those realms. Um, the individual level is more things like uh, self-esteem, self-efficacy, and the relationship level is related to kind of that peer and parental conversations related to use and, and substances in general. And these are all really important prevention strategies that we still employ today, but they don't exist outside of the broader context of our current scope and more holistic approach. So here I think is a really good depiction of where our efforts and approaches are really centered. So like I discussed earlier, a lot of those individual and relationship level approaches that the state had previously employed were in that midstream uh, as seen in the diagram here. And it, it's still great, right? Because it's above downstream when we get to clinical care, but there's really a lot ahead on that topper part of the hill that we could be at, right? And so moving into the, the new approach that PBHP is currently employing and, and plans to continue on in the future is really changing uh, those conditions in our communities and the environments that we are, right? Those social determinants of health that we've talked about and are really creating lasting and community impact for our community members. So to chat a little bit about our frameworks and models, and again, our programs that we'll discuss in, in the coming slide um, are developed based off of these frameworks, as well as the, the general core of the unit. And so the frameworks and models that we use are the social ecological model, the strategic prevention framework, and uh, the strategies under the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, or the CSAP strategies. And again, these are not only interwoven into all of our programs, but is really the foundation of our unit as a whole. And so some of the programs that we have under our PBHP umbrella, if you will, are the COVID-19 projects, which Gabrielle did touch a little bit about some of the programs that were funded with COVID-19 supplemental funds. So uh, we do have some prevention programs that receive those additional funds. Our youth prevention programs are our YPs our Community Coalition Partnerships, or CCPs, Prevention Resource Centers, or PRCs, 
statewide media campaign and the Texas prevention training. So as you can see, we love acronyms, right? <laughs> but uh, first up with our COVID-19 projects, which again, as Gabrielle mentioned, these are um, some pre-existing programs that we already had in our unit, but received additional funds uh, through the HR133 and uh, ERPA dollars from the American Rescue Plan from the federal government. And so um, these CCPs, which we'll talk a little bit more in depth about them in the coming slides, but really as a whole, the community coalition partnerships received these additional funds to truly enhance behavioral health and wellness and implement some of those stress reduction and trauma healing activities that are so crucial as our communities continue to recover and heal from COVID. Um, additionally, we have the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health or the TIMH group that did receive some funds to implement innovative healing centered projects that are relatively new, but really, really exciting to again, um, heal our communities and work together as a unit. And the tobacco program, again, this was a pre-existing program under PBHP and um, a little bit about the tobacco program, we have, a, it's really a multi-pronged program. We have a year-round statewide tobacco enforcement that goes on um, under the scope of stings and controlled buys. We also have prevention strategies that are going on, of course, preventing use, uh, cessation strategies that go on and um, the SINAR survey and report. So for some of you that might not be as familiar with SINAR, um, it's a, a federal requirement that all states are required to uh, abide by to continue to receive those federal block grants that we discussed earlier that not only fund our programs, but a number of others. So it's a really, really important program. And essentially, it's a testament of how well Texas is doing when it comes to tobacco enforcement. So it involves controlled buys and stings statewide to produce a retail violation rate that we must stay under to, again, ensure the continuation of our funds. And so it's a really huge initiative. So it's really, really important and crucial that we were able to funnel additional funds to that program with COVID dollars. And our YPs or our youth prevention program. So this might be one that a lot of you are, are familiar with. We have three different classifications for our YP programs. The YP Universal or the YPU that focuses on the general population, anyone can receive. Uh, the YPS or the YP Selected that focuses on subgroups of the general population that might be at an increased risk for use than, than the average population. And the YP Indicated or the YPI that focuses on people in those high risk environments. And here in this slide, we have a list of all of the curricula that um, our providers in the field implement and along with the with the classifications and I do want to kind of venture back to yesterday when we had a really great presentation to discuss some of the um, new resources that TEA has pushed out, one of which the repository on best practices. And I will say these curricula are all on that best practices list. So we really appreciate uh, the acknowledgement from TEA. And again, please feel free to learn more about that on their resource. But um, these are the, again, the curriculum that are provided in the field. And our YP programs currently provide these services in 187 of the 254 counties in the state. So really quite a broad reach. Moving on to our community coalition partnerships. Again, these are the CCPs that received additional COVID dollars. Uh, but really our CCPs are a collaborative partnership of folks in a community that strive to address uh, one or more of those um, prevention priorities of the state and really hammer down on community <clears throat> behavioral health more broadly. Um, CCPs utilize a number of frameworks that um, mobilize communities and again, are evidence-based environmental strategies with the primary focus to change policies and influence those social norms that are around us. Then moving on to our prevention resource centers. Again, this might be one that y'all are um, already in touch with and using as a resource, but our prevention resource centers or our PRCs serve as a main data repository. And there's one PRC for every region as indicated below. And 
In essence, these PRCs serve as, as the glue for their region. They know not only the most current uh, substance use trends and patterns uh, for your region, they also know where local YPs are in their region, CCPs, and a number of other organizations. So they really are, I like to call them the glue of their region. And just to give a little bit more context about the core of the PRCs, they have four main pillars or cores, uh, one of which is maintaining and providing a lot of that important data to everyone in the region, the data core, uh, the training core to help build the prevention workforce capacity, the media core to help increase the communities or their regions understanding and awareness of substance use and, and the harms related to that, and the Tobacco Prevention Corps, which again is huge for the SINAR program um, by providing year-round statewide retailer education and other related monitoring activities um, in compliance, retail compliance. Perfect. And the statewide media campaign, I'm really excited to chat with you about this today. It was recently launched, so I'm going to go ahead and put the link to this in the chat. And um, if you miss it, don't fret because we do also have this on, I think the FAQ that's in the box drive. I don't wanna butcher that, but the box platform. Um, but again, I posted in the chat just for your convenience. This statewide social media campaign, like I had mentioned, uh, was recently launched and the public health campaign engages uh, really all Texans, youth, young adults, parents, and communities through a number of media platforms. And um, the campaign provides social media messages to all of our other programs, the PRC, CCPs, and YPs uh, within PBHP to really just enhance and again, work under that holistic community approach that we talked about earlier in the upstream approach. And just a little background on the campaign, um, our vendor Fleshman Hillard at the UT Center for Health Communication used uh, formative research findings from UT's work to create the content for the campaign. So it's a really complex campaign and again, really excited to share that with you today. And the Texas Prevention Training. So the training prevention, uh, the Texas Prevention Training is a statewide coordinated system of prevention training and technical assistance services to support and enhance prevention workforce development in, in the state. And so um, this entity is responsible for training um, all of the other programs that we've talked about thus far with the most up-to-date prevention science, best practices, and a multitude of other approaches designed to support the effective implementation of evidence-based strategies um, across the state. So again, this is a crucial piece really to all of PBHP because it supports all of the other programs. So with that being said, I will also go ahead. Um, TPT provides a link to the provider directory. So in case you're wondering, who your local PRC is or how you can get in contact with local folks that provide YP services. I've posted the link in the chat to um, the Texas Prevention Directory. And I think, let me go ahead and check. I might have put the wrong link in here. I'll go ahead and redrop that. But if you would like to um, take a look at that, uh, that's uh, another one of our resources. If you have any questions about anything I've discussed today, please feel free to email me directly at, at the email displayed here. Um, again, thank you so much for your time and I'll pass it off to my colleague, uh, Leticia. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Leticia Valderas McDonald. And uh, I am the Treatment for Youth Coordinator with Health and Human Services Commission. I'm gonna go over the uh, definition for substance use. I'm gonna talk about the different uh, treatment services for youth, the youth recovery communities. I'm gonna talk also about outreach, screen, assessment, and referral known as OS the OSAR and uh, their resources. I do wanna start off with saying, I think this has been a wonderful conference. Um, I have been in this field for over 30 years, and I, I just love what I'm seeing here. I, I really love that the schools are opening up more to services that youth need because it's so needed. Um, so one of the things I did want to share with you guys is that in the last two years, 
because of COVID, our youth have really been impacted. And we didn't know, uh, we didn't know how big the impact was going to be and what it would be. But one of the things that we have seen is that in the last two years, because of the closures of schools and referral sources, a lot of our youth did not get the treatment services that they needed. So slowly as things have begun to open back up, we're beginning to see some of that impact through our referrals. And one of the things has, that has come up a lot recently are the fentanyl overdoses of our youth there had, uh, across Texas, and not just Texas, this is nationwide, but in Texas, there has been an in, increase in youth overdoses uh, with fentanyl. They have been using pills and different types of drugs that have been laced with fentanyl. So we have seen that increase. So I think that this co uh, conference comes at a really wonderful time where you guys are gonna be able to get all these resources that are so needed. And uh, our, our kids are in need of these services. So I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this today. So substance use disorder. The essential feature of a substance use disorder is a cluster of cognitive, behavioral, and physiological symptoms indicating that the individual continues using substances despite significant substance-related problems. So these are some of the items that we look for for the diagnostic cr criteria of substance use disorder. Each specific substance other than caffeine is treated as a separate disorder, such as alcohol use disorder, cocaine use disorder, and so on. Most uh, substance use disorders are diagnosed based on the same 11 criteria over a 12 month period. That just means that when we ask them the questions it, during the screening or the assessment, we're gonna go back for the whole year. We don't just do it based on right now, this month, we do it for the whole year. And uh, the severity of the substance use is determined by the number of criteria met by the patient. Mild is two to three criteria, moderate is four to five criteria, and then severe is six or more. Now I'm gonna go into the criteria. So uh, the 11 criteria for SED are divided into four different categories of behavior related to the substance use. So we have impaired control. This is where they're using more of the substance than they intended. Maybe they said, okay, I'm only gonna smoke half a joint or take a hit off of a joint and they smoke the whole thing. Or they said, okay, I'm only gonna drink two beers, but they drank the whole 12 pack or 24 pack. So they're using more than they intended to. Wanted to cut down or stop using, but unable to do so. Social impairment, neglecting re responsibilities and relationships, giving up activities that they used to care about because of the substance use inability to complete tasks at home, school, or work. So in this area, this might be the youth that maybe they love football uh, or cheerleading, but slowly they start backing off. This could be one of the reasons why. And we have risky use, using in risky uh, settings, continued use despite known problems, even though they know that it's gonna make their grades go down or cause some problems with their family members, that use continues and physical dependence, needing more of the substance to get the same effect. They can get a tolerance to uh, drug use. And having withdrawal symptoms is it when the substance is not used. And when we say withdrawal symptoms, we don't mean like shaking and sweating. It could be as, as minor as being irritable, having headaches, uh, stomach ache, things like that. So said treatment programs for youth. Th these programs involve youth and their families and recovery efforts through treatment and continuing care. These programs serve youth ages 13 to 17. Now they can admit a youth, a young adult ages 18 to 21, if the screening shows that they have the needs, experience and behaviors of those like uh, the youth. Uh, sometimes we do have an 18 or 20 year old, 21 year old who is still in school, still at home and still experiencing a lot of those adolescent behaviors. So there are times that they, they may put them in, into the program with the 13 to 17 year old. Uh, the providers have to get permission to do that. And also, rec even recently, we have been getting a uh, request to bring in youth younger than 13. There, some of our providers are seeing that they're getting youth as young as 11 and 12 
that have been using and need treatment services. Anytime any of our providers have this, where we have somebody younger than 13, they do have to reach out to me and get approval to put in somebody younger than 13. So residential treatment services. These are licensed facilities that provide the treatment services for the youth and to help them learn skills for recovery. So these uh, services include counseling, case management, education, education in the form of relapse prevention, uh, chemical dependency education, life skills, and also recovery skills training. And these options are the different levels of care are intensive or supportive. Intensive is where they're, they'll get at least 45 hours of services per week. And that includes school. They have to be in school uh, every day of the week. Uh, these facilities do provide school on site. So in these uh, services, they also have to do some recreational activities. And uh, we do highly recommend that they include the family as much as possible in family education, family counseling sessions. In your supportive residential, this is a lower level of care. It's still residential, but it's, it's less hours. It's at least 21 hours per week. And again, they do attend school while they're there. Then the last one that we have, the last level of care is outpatient. This is for a lower severity, and it's usually provided in a community setting. Uh, the youth there do not need to be in a highly structured environment. so they typically are still at home and they may come to the facility maybe once or twice or three times a week for their sessions. And treatment in outpatient includes, includes counseling, case management, education, and recovery training. Now, one of the things with outpatient is they have the ability to do adolescent support services. So that means that anything, any kind of collaboration, anything having to do with supporting that youth for their recovery, the, the clinicians are able to do that. That includes contacts with probation officers, parole officers, schools, drug courts, uh, truancy court, anything where they're trying to get that youth to remain in recovery. And they also have the ability to do family support services, which is again, the same thing as adolescent support but for the family. So anything with the family where they're trying to tie them into recovery and, and getting the family involved, even as, as far as being able to do family sessions and education in the home, they have the ability to do that in these programs. And uh, these are all state-funded programs. These, all of these programs work with people who have Medicaid that don't have insurance or even private insurances. So what are the benefits for youth in treatment? Treatment can help the youth to improve their ability to deal with life's challenges, with their thinking, making better decisions, making better recreational choices, and uh, an increase in interaction with their family and other folks in a positive way. So in order to get uh, the youth in treatment, you have different pathways you can take. The simplest way and the way that is used most often is going directly to the provider. And if you, uh, I, we do have links on here where you can click on and, and uh, there will be a map that will take, you can just put the zip code and it'll take you to the different providers in that area. So there are different avenues to get into treatment. You can go directly through the provider. You can go through your local, local or SAR provider, or you can also use your local mental health authority or local behavioral health authority. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about youth recovery community. Uh, before I go into this, I do wanna say, one of the things I love about what the state is doing is the continuum of care, because you, know, you have prevention and intervention programs, which are offered in the schools or in community centers. And then you have the treatment option, which I just talked about. So that's that continuum of care where youth that, uh, need treatment are able to do that. And here we have youth recovery communities for those youth that have completed treatment that can go into a youth recovery community to continue to learn recovery skills. So uh, with youth recovery communities, these provide support services to youth who have a substance use disorder or who just want to be in an environment where there's no drugs and alcohol to support their goals and what they want to do with their life by provi providing peer support and engagement in environments and activities that are drug-free. 
So this program is for youth ages 13 to 18 and their families. And these include local community organizations that allow, allow the youth and their families to participate regardless of where they are in recovery. And it also helps to increase their family participation and strengthen their family ties. So the youth doesn't have to be in recovery or clean to participate in the youth recovery community. Th these programs meet the youth wherever they're at. So this is the list of all the youth recovery communities that we serve across Texas. Uh, we have their contact information there and their addresses. Now, OSAR, this is the Outreach Screening Assessment and Referral Services. Uh, these are available to anyone interested in information about substance use services in Texas. And it can be a starting point for people who want help uh, getting substance use services but don't know where to start. They can include substance use screenings and assessment, referrals to treatment programs or other services, and education on substance use. The OSAR services, the eligibility, sorry, eligibility is that uh, you must be a Texas resident. The OSAR services can determine if people are eligible for substance use treatment that is funded by Texas Health and Human Services Commission on a case-by-case -case basis. They screen and assess, uh, the screening and assessment services are based on a person's self-report. So they're gonna either do it through a telephone or face-to-face -face contact, and it's gonna be whatever it is that the person is reporting. To be eligible, a person must meet two or more of the current diagnostic criteria within the 12 month period. And records involving substance use are subject to federal privacy laws. So this is just a list of all of the OSARs in all of the regions, regions one through 11. And this is just a map of uh, all of the OSARs. So thank you. If you have any questions or comments or would like some more information, my email address is here and you are welcome to shoot me an email. Thank you so much. And so we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, we have like a prepared frequently asked question kind of from all of our areas. And I'm gonna throw that into the chat, um, but it's also loaded on your, um, in the box under resources for panel. I'm gonna try to load it in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and so you should be able to access it there. It is not wanting to <clears throat> load for me, sorry. Well, while I'm figuring that out, we can um, go ahead and start at least going over that. And that way, if there's any additional questions, we can try to get those answered as well. And we have a, so, a, about three questions, Gabrielle, in the Q&A okay. um, that have, are listed. So we could start with those um, okay. just because I'm, I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure we get to those. But the frequently asked questions cover kind of like where to find different resources within each of these areas. And so they have the links to the various websites. Um, and so if you're looking for specific resources, it's going to be a great place to just go and get it in one simple one page spot. Um, Thank you. And so for the Q&A's, do you just want me to read them out loud and then we respond or? Yes, that will be great. And they'll be captured on the recording for those that watch later. So in regards to children's crisis respite, does this service lend itself to families who have children with a diagnosis of autism? And so the Yes, it could, um, but they would need to have be experiencing that crisis. Um, and so the local mental health authorities that are that are housing the children's crisis respite programs will have criteria where they will assess that youth to determine if they meet those needs. So autism is not going to be a disqualifying factor. It would just if they meet those crisis services respite um, needs. And the next one is any curriculum resources for substance abuse intervention and prevention that are low cost or free? Yes, I can take that one. Um, thank you so much for that question, Laura. 
And I did, I can go ahead and put it again, but we do have a link to the provider directory. So that way you can browse programs that are close to you um, within substance use prevention. I think what you might be looking for is that YPI, that indicated population. And um, all of our services are completely free. So great news there. <laughs> Please feel free to yeah look at the program or the provider directory and the link that I've just added in the chat to take a look at again which um, providers might be closest to you. But yes, free. Okay, I can take that last one. Awesome. Uh, do you find that youth needing treatment have family members that are also in need, and are they being sent back to a toxic environment? Thank you, Maria, for that question. Uh, yes, we are finding that a lot of times there are family members that are in need of treatment. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we offer family services, why we do the family counseling and the, the family education to educate about without putting on a spot. And uh, I think that's also a reason why a lot of the families have a hard time allowing their youth or sending their youth to treatment because then they're going to have to take a look at their own stuff and what they're doing. So uh, yes, we do find that sometimes. And we've also found that sometimes by educating them and doing the counseling, that opens up that door to allow them to also see that there's a need for them to get some help. And there have been times where even the youth confronts the parent about their use. I, I have had some experiences in the past where our youth, the youth don't, after they've been in treatment a while, they will confront their parents about some of those issues. And um, unfortunately, some of those youth do get sent back to those toxic environments. And, you know, I stated earlier, I've been in this field over 30 years and I've worked with all populations. And sometimes the youth is the hardest to work with in treatment because for that reason, because not always, not all the time are the family members willing to get treatment or get help. And it's very difficult when you have a youth who's really blossoming in treatment and doing well, and no one you have to send them back there. Uh, and there's just not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot for the youth available out there in terms of halfway houses or sending them somewhere if they're under the age of 18 uh, for, you know, for, for long-term recovery. So with the youth recovery communities, that's, that's really helpful because they're keep, the youth are able to engage long-term in recovery communities where they can be somewhere where they're drug, where they're drug free and uh, having drug free activities. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes we do have to send them back to those environments. And that's why it's so important for us to plug them into other resources like the youth recovery communities and uh, other APGs, which is an alternative peer group or 12 step meetings where they can have some kind of a support for ongoing recovery. Thank you. And I believe that was all the questions um, in the Q and A. And I also think we are out of time. So Rohana, I saw you pop back on the screen. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs>